Warm greetings to each and every one of you. My name is Paul Andre Zeroche. I'm the Archbishop of Gatineau. And this is a series of reflections that I'm presenting on the Advent readings. Today is December 1st, Tuesday of the first week of Advent. Our first reading is from the book of Isaiah, as it will be most of the weekdays of Advent. We focus on the prophet Isaiah because his texts were key to understanding for the first Christians of how Jesus was fulfilling uh, the hope that was expressed in the writings of prophets such as Isaiah. Uh, we're reading uh, chapter 11 today, the beginning of chapter 11. Uh, just before the end of chapter 10, Isaiah has been very hard. Now, Isaiah is uh, He's not just one prophet. To start with, the book of Isaiah is was written over two centuries. So there's an original prophet, Isaiah. Then other prophets came and enriched his writings with their own. So it's always hard to tell whether this is the original prophet who's writing eight centuries before the time of Christ or a later prophet who's writing six centuries before the time of Christ, during or after the exile. But here he's writing in a time of crisis for the kingdom of uh, Judea. The, the successors of David have not been faithful to the covenant as far as Isaiah is concerned. They've broken the covenant. They've not been kings of righteousness, of justice. They've oppressed their own people. And so there is a strong sense that God is going to judge uh, this, these kings and he's going to put an end practically to the, the line of David. Though, though there had been a promise originally that it would always be a descendant of David who would reign over the people. So Isaiah kind of shifts between this strong judgment of God and then always this little hope that comes in that, well, maybe something good will come out. And so at the end of chapter 10, it's the strong judgment that God is going to put it, an end to this and that he's going to cut down the tall trees, you know, like the leaders are going to be, they're just going to be cut down. But out of this strong condemnation comes this word of hope. And it's a word of hope that is very, it's well known uh, from by Christians because it's one of the key texts uh, that we reinterpret in the light of Jesus himself. And it starts this way. A shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. Who is Jesse? Jesse was the father of David. So when he's speaking about, you know, the, the tree of Jesse, he's speaking about the line of the descendants of King David. He's just said that God is going to cut this down. But he's saying, but out of that stump, there will, a shoot will spring forth. So there's kind of a hope that is still left there. And he's saying of this uh, descendant of David, he's saying the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This is so typical of um, Jewish poetry, huh? things go in twos, always two synonyms side by side. And here this is a clear echo of the book of Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs, the, the, there's a description of the wise king. And it's practically the same elements that we recognize here. That, that a king, in order to be a good king, has to have this spirit of wisdom and understanding and of counsel, and of might, and of knowledge, and particularly of fear of the Lord. So Isaiah emphasizes that his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Now, fear of the Lord, perhaps the better translation for us would be awe, awe before God, just a deep sense of the greatness of God and of our littleness. And so there's a kind of, a, at the same time that we are attracted by God, there's a real sense of the great distance between God and us. And so in that sense, that fear or that, that awe before God is the beginning, according to the book of Proverbs, is the beginning of wisdom. This is where wisdom is rooted. If we recognize that we are not the sovereigns, but God is the sovereign, then that is the beginning of wisdom. And so the Isaiah goes on, he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. In other words, he won't follow appearances, 
but with righteousness. He shall judge the poor and with equity decide for the meek of the earth. This is a remarkable vision of what the king should be. He should not be about protecting the poor, the, the rich and the mighty. He should be on the side of the poor and of the meek. So in other words, the king should be the one who defends those who have less. And this is not what typical kings do. Usually kings take care of their own. Kings or queens, rulers, emperors, prime ministers, presidents, they often take care of their own. We've seen it over and over again in the history of the world. Here, Isaiah's vision is completely contrary, that this king will care for the poor and the meek. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. In other words, his sentences, his decrees. And notice here that the king is seen, first of all, as a judge, not so much as a ruler, but as a judge, the one who decides what is right and what is wrong and puts down the mighty. We hear an echo of Mary's canticle of the Magnificat. He raises up the lowly. God raises up the lowly. He puts down the mighty. This is what this king will be doing. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his, his loins. So he will be girded with righteousness and with faithfulness. Now, the text moves here. There's a move in the text from looking at this king who will be a, a king of justice and of faithfulness in relationship with God and caring for the poor and the oppressed. It moves to an image of the cosmos where harmony has been recreated between all of creation itself, even in nature. There will be no more uh, violence in nature itself. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together and the little child will lead them. These, this is a remarkable imagery here that, that the, uh, the, the wolf lying down with the lamb, usually wolves kill lambs. No, they will lie down together. So these violent, powerful animals Will become peaceful and all of nature will will somehow be reconciled and a little child a symbol of innocence and of vulnerability will be able to lead them you know it's it's an impossible dream sending a child to shepherd a bunch of lions who would do that nobody would ever do that but this imagery is is an imagery of deep peace and harmony the cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. And here this, the, the, this image of these children, uh, vulnerable and innocent, not being hurt by a serpent, is kind of a direct echo of the creation story, where the serpent was the animal that brought Adam and Eve, uh, twisted their words, uh, tented them, and brought them into moving away from their relationship with God. Here there's kind of a reconciliation between humanity and even the worst of these animals, the serpent. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. The holy mountain is the mountain of Sion, the mountain of Jerusalem. And for, for uh, the prophet Isaiah, Jerusalem is a symbol of all of Judea. It's the heart where, from where God rules. So there will be no more hurt or pain on the mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And here we see the connection between this vision of a righteous king and of a renewed cosmos. And the reading ends this way. On that day, the root of Jesse, this, this descendant of Jesse, this king, shall stand as a signal to all the peoples. So not just for Israel, but all peoples. He will be kind of a, a source of inspiration for all peoples. 
The nations shall inquire of him and his dwelling shall be glorious. So that there's a kind of a harmony that goes from nature that, that affects all nations. This vision of peace is such a, a deep dream that I, I think we can all connect with that. Wherever we are, whatever we're living, we can connect with that. And we can see how the early Christians really uh, reconnected this reading with Jesus himself. They saw in Jesus the descendant of David, the king of peace who comes in humility to care for the poor, for the downtrodden, and is trying to bring about the peace among all nations so that he is recognized, you could say, as the source of healing for all people. Um, ultimately, this vision has not been realized in Jesus, and it is from that continuing hunger, the sense that Jesus, Jesus' work is not done yet, that this vision of peace has not been fully realized, fully accomplished, that Christians live in the hope, the expectation of a final glorious day when this dream will be realized in what we call the coming of the glorious Christ. And this hope continues to inspire our own commitment and our own involvement in making this world a peaceable world, a world where the poor and the meek are cared for and justice is truly done. Let's move on to the gospel. And during these uh, first uh, practically 10 days of the Easter season, the gospel will be chosen uh, in connection with the readings of Isaiah. So it's really the prophet Isaiah that is leading our reflection, and the gospel kind of makes those connections. So today, here's the connection. It's taken from Luke's gospel, chapter 10, verse 21 to 24. Uh, the context here is that Jesus has sent off 70 of his disciples to go and speak his message of renewal, of God's coming justice, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the reign of God, a reign of justice and of peace and of joy coming, and an invitation to, con to be converted, to choose to enter into this kingdom. These 70 have gone off and they come back, returned with joy, and they told Jesus all that they had done. Uh, and at that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. The, the Greek word here is pra practically one of an ecstatic experience, a mystical experience. He exalted, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit, and he turns to God and prays, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. So, so here he's, he's rejoicing in the fact that God's plan is being worked out through him and through these disciples who've gone out to preach this renewal. And these are not high and mighty people. They are not, you know, uh, educated. They are not the leaders of the people. They are just ordinary people who've connected with the vision of God and now have become proclaimers of that vision. And Jesus is re rejoicing before that. And then he has this remarkable sentence. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And the reason this sentence is so striking is that in the Gospel of Luke, we find it also in the Gospel of Matthew. There's, there's no other sentence quite like this, but we find in the Gospel of John many sentences like this, where, where the Son, Jesus speaks of him as self, as the Son who is revealing the deep inner being, you could say, of the Father. And the Father knows the Son, the Son knows the Father, and in coming to know the Son, we also can know the Father. So it, it's it's Yes, it's a mystical vision of the very being of who Jesus is in his relationship 
with the Father. And the fact that the Son chooses to reveal the Father to others, who in turn become his messengers, is um, reflects this mission that is given to each of us. We are called to enter into a relationship with the Father through the Son, but to become then his messengers to others, so that others also might be able to know the source of life and of love. And then the excerpt continues. Then turning to the disciples, Jesus said to them privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, but did not see it. Hear what you hear, but not, did not hear it. And here what Jesus is saying is that I am fulfilling what prophets had announced, what prophets had hoped for. You see, so that, for example, the prophecy that we uh, read in, in Isaiah, this vision of the king of justice, this vision of a world of harmony and of reconciliation, of your healing, uh, it was never realized. Jesus is saying, but now it is realized. And blessed are you. So this is a beatitude. Blessed are you for being able to see this. You are truly fortunate. You are entering into God's kingdom. The kingdom is breaking into this world, and you are part of it. Blessed are you. And this blessing comes to us if we truly believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises. If we truly believe that he is the Son of God, and that he al allows us, he, he introduces us into the very heart of God, then indeed we are blessed. And this blessing, we are called to share it with others. So this is, for today's readings, an invitation to rejoice, to live in the hope that Isaiah expressed, to see it realized in Jesus, and to, to rejoice for that blessing that has been given to us. Blessings to each and every one of you.